This is the current federal tax developments for the week of August the 10th, 2020. Current federal tax developments are brought to you by Kaplan Financial Education and by your state society of CPAs. I'm Ed Zollers coming to you here from Phoenix, Arizona, and we are looking this week at some developments, including one that occurred not long before I started recording this session. So we're going to have a very, very recent development to come up here at the end. And we'll talk about what we know about that and why we know it's going to generate some additional guidance. But let's talk about some stuff. Last week, I mentioned that we were going to talk this week a little bit about the final regulations under 163J. Now, they were issued, Treasury Decision 9905, issued on July the 29th, 2020. And they are nearly 600 pages long. They also came out with a bunch of proposed regulations that go on for another couple hundred pages. And with a revenue procedure or a proposed revenue procedure, we're going to talk about it here a little bit later. So there's a lot of guidance there. However, for the stuff we're going to worry about here in today's session, it pretty much, but not totally, follows the proposed regulations that we got back at the end of 2018. They did make a few changes there, but again, nothing huge. Uh, one thing they did do is they added some items in those proposed regs under 163J for the CARES Act revisions. Uh, CARES Act, remember, changed how 163J is going to work for 2019 and 2020, and that's going to cause us some issues uh, with structures and doing things and potentially needing to revise tax returns if we did an individual return or a C-Corp return or an S-Corp return that had used the lower 30% rather than 50% limitation. Uh, you do have an option there. You can stick with the 30% if you wanted or cares. And they have a special rule for partnerships that's going to generally make your excess business income, your excess business interest, I should say, expense, that is passed out to the partner this year on their K-1 from 2019, one half of that would be fully deductible next year, regardless of whether it would have been deductible anyway. You just get that the other half. So half of your excess business interest expense in 2019 simply because absolute becomes absolutely without question deductible interest expense next year. And the rest of it becomes, you know, in the standard way that we treat excess business interest expense under these 163J rules. Now, I've been going through these final regs and, you know, cleaning some things up. I'm going to be doing an advanced partnership course a week from Monday, actually a week from the day this officially is released. So it'll be on the 17th. And so I'm looking at that because we're going to probably want to discuss that in the course because the partnership issues that deal with these rules are rather involved. And so it is something important. They did keep the 11 step allocation for partnerships. So if you've done partnerships and you did them under the proposed regs, and remember the 11 step allocation method, that's still there. Uh, I mean, I understand why we have a method of that sort, why it's that messy is because partnerships are complicated. And we're told that this interest has to be measured at the entity level. But we have the problem that, you know, what we have is ATI and we have interest expense. And somehow we've got to get those in line because if somebody has excess adjusted taxable income, then that actually gives them an advantage on their personal return. So we have to figure out we got to get the ATI matched with the interest expense. And it's a bit messy in the 11 structures and also excess has to also be properly allocated. So we get into a bit of a mess there with that allocation. So if you've not gone through the 11 steps, they're loads of fun. In fact, that section, the area dealing with the pass-throughs has 21 separate examples, and many of which are, you know, I think, examples 17 through 20, what, 20 or something are all dealing with the 11-step allocation method and walking through that step by step. So it's actually, if you go through those, it actually begins to make sense as much as it can. But you really have to go through there to pick up and see how this stuff interacts. So I would suggest you do that. As you're aware, S-corporations, there had been some discussion when they did proposed regs that there were two ways to read 163J. You could read it as saying, well, partnerships and S's really would have radically different treatment. Or you could read it to say that they really had to have the same treatment. And we had to come up with some simplified method to cover both. They eventually just decided, no, S-corps can have a very simple method. 
fact, it is very simple and generally taxpayer friendly because excess everything stays at the entity level, unlike partnerships where we have an entity test the year we incur the interest, and then afterwards we have a weird half entity, half individual deal, and yeah, it just gets messy from that point forward. But we will, you know, it's kind of interesting how that runs. But they did keep that. And as I said, they had that series of examples there to be studied. Now, the one really big thing I think to mention of this that we've been waiting for was an issue we covered last week. Uh, and we covered it in the reg it's in, although it's actually key to this reg, is the treatment of the syndicate rule. And if you didn't listen to last week's broadcast, you want to go back and pick that up because the syndicate rule is key here. If your entity is ruled to be a syndicate under the cash basis of accounting option, the accounting method rules that allow you to automatically elect the cash basis of accounting, a small business can do that, but not if the small business, and small business is defined by average revenues of under $26 million currently for the prior three years, but that small business cannot elect cash basis if it is if it is what's called a tax shelter. I went through the three categories. The problem category is this syndicate category. And we discussed last week how the problem there is if you have 35% of losses allocated to limited entrepreneurs. And what that really means is essentially limited partners, limited entrepreneurs. What that really means is going to be equity holders, pass-through equity holders, that do not materially participate in the activity, not really under 469, but kind of, and it's a really weird rule. And there's some deemed active participations. I think it was under 1256 is the odd place you're going to find the rules. They hide all over the place. They're just strange. They were discussed in last week's materials. But the real problem is that a lot of real estate partnerships will meet that requirement and become a major problem. And this year, with what's happened in the economy, some operating businesses may suddenly for the first time find losses and now run into this same problem that they'll be considered to be a essentially a tax shelter, a syndicate. And there was no exception put in for, you know, any sort of real estate structure, anything of that sort. And remember, you might say, well, I don't want to be cash basis. That's not relevant. They use that qualified to automatically elect cash basis to get you out of 163J's limit on business interest. And remember, 163J limits business interest to 30% of what's called adjusted taxable income, which is your taxable income before interest and before your depreciation, amortization currently. Eventually, those two go away. For purposes of the syndicate rule, we do not, we go ahead and allow all the interest on paper to see if we have a loss. And then if we have, if we do have a loss, we become a syndicate. And the fact that when we limit our deduction to 30% of that number, we no longer have a loss becomes irrelevant. We're still a syndicate and we're still clipped. And that may force the partnership, if they don't want to get nailed horribly by the interest rules, which it could be if they're highly leveraged, they're going to have to make that election to use ADS depreciation permanently on real estate. And even if they cease to be a tax shelter, cease to be a syndicate, or we finally get the interest down, where it's not a problem, we can't get out of that. So yeah, it, it's an issue. So I really think the syndicate rule is a big problem. I will be doing that course a week from Monday. Uh, where we will talk about the partnership rules and how they apply under these rules. It'll be an advanced partnership course. And this is something I'm adding to the course now because it came out, it finalized. There'd been suggestions they might be going to radically change the 11-step rules. Uh, didn't happen. So now I can be serious and say, yeah, that's how this works. So we'll talk about it there. Now, back to the old things. We, we haven't seen the, one of these in a while. We got a brand new FAQ from the Small Business Administration. The Paycheck Protection Program frequently asked questions now on PPP loan forgiveness because we're getting awfully close to the day that the SBA is going to start taking those forgiveness applications from the bank. The applications the bank has approved, and now the SBA is going to finally approve so that formally you could get forgiveness. Well, they've been waiting to see if Congress would change the law. But the problem is we're running up on the deadline, running up the time they're going to start looking at this stuff, and Congress very likely won't get to fixing things that quickly. They're still, when I'm recording this today, they were negotiating through Friday. They had stopped negotiating. I'm recording this on Saturday. Uh, 
Uh, they are not getting together supposedly today. And so it's very, very likely that we will hit the point where the SBA is going to take applications and we won't have any changes yet. So we'll get it there. Now, this FAQ is divided into four categories. It talks about general forgiveness, loan forgiveness, payroll costs, loan forgiveness, non-payroll costs, and loan forgiveness reduction issues. So four big categories. Now, one nice thing in the general application it did is it confirmed that if you're a sole proprietor, self-employed, you have no employees, you basically just complete the 3508AEZ and you essentially should qualify for full forgiveness if you got the right amount of a loan. 2.5 months of your 2019 Schedule C income, you should be able to immediately qualify and be able to get full forgiveness. That shouldn't be a problem at this point. Uh, the general facts also had some other things there. They told lenders they can accept electronic signatures as long as there's no other regulatory problem with that. Expect a lot of lenders to require you to do the application form for forgiveness online. That's where I expect going to see a lot of them. That's where it was there. Uh, it outlined when a borrower has to make loan payments as long as they apply within 10 months after the end of their covered period. They don't have to make any payments until such time as the SBA and the bank have ruled on forgiveness. So that makes it a little bit easier. Now, they also talked about uh, loan forgiveness payroll costs and some of the issues there. You know, they, they confirmed the whole rule about paid and incurred that you can pay for wages uh, that that you were that maybe have been earned before the covered period. So I've got 24, you know, I've got 24 week covered period. I come in, I write a payroll check on the first day. It covers a pay period that all expired before we start our covered period. That still counts. Also tells us on the back end, if we don't have, if we don't pay the payroll on the last day that covers every day of the last day, we would allocate, you know, we'd pick up the next payroll paid. We pick up any part of that that might relate to to services performed during the covered period would also count. So that, that's the incurred aspects there. So it works for that. They did. They basically clarified, which should have been clear to you, that if you pick the alternative, uh, basically payroll covered period, and you have a pay period that is like, is a multiple of weekly, you know, it's either weekly or biweekly, that essentially you won't have any split up of that last payroll. You shouldn't. As long as you started on the pay date and you started with your next payroll period, that it'll always work out. But if you are a semi-monthly payroll or some other time period that's not a multiple, remember, semi-monthly is not allowed to, if you're a greater, if your pay period is longer than bi-weekly, you cannot use the alternative payroll covered period. So they're saying if you are like a bi-monthly payroll, you know, or I should say semi-monthly payroll, uh, you're going to have to do an allocation on that last payroll. That's not going to be an option. They also reminded us that you can use bonuses, hazard pay. If you're making up for lost tips of your employees, right? You know, you're making for some other similar payment that's lost compensation because the economy's fall apart, lost commissions because you couldn't make sales. Those all count. Those are going to be fine. They're still going to be considered wages for purposes of forgiveness. So don't worry about that, right? That's not going to be a problem in our structure. Also clarified, use gross payroll. I think that's there mainly because of the confusion initially in the program, uh, where some of the uh, worksheets that people like Paychecks, ADP came up with, were using net because that was really what the law kind of said. But now we're going back and saying, no, you'll use gross for this. Don't worry about net. Uh, they did do something kind of nice for entity owners, which was a little bit weird. Now, basically, here's the catch. There's a bit of a surprise for entity owners here. And so let's talk a little bit about it. A couple of key things were clarified. First, if you are a corporate shareholder, okay, a corporate shareholder has loan forgiveness of your cash compensation is limited to 2.5 months of last year's cash compensation. That amount, if you pay it during the covered period, can count toward forgiveness, capped at the maximum number of 20833 which is based on the $100,000 cap. Okay, that, that's basically there. However, payments other than for cash compensation essentially do not count toward the cap. 
apparently, and don't count for the 2.5 months. That's not totally clear, but it seems to be. I've seen people argue, try to argue both ways. I've seen some worksheets that go both ways now following this FAQ. But the way I read it, only your cash compensation as the owner, if you're a C-Corp shareholder or you're an S-Corp shareholder, is going to be capped. If you're a C-Corp shareholder, I can add to that my health care costs, and I can add my retirement plan costs. If I'm an S-Corp shareholder, uh, if I'm an S-Corp shareholder or a 2%er, you know, any way we look at that are related to a to a 2% shareholder, so that I'm considered by attribution to be a 2% shareholder, I'm not going to get health care for those people because that should be in their W-2. But what they're telling you is throw it in wages. It's going to be in wages, but it will still be, unfortunately, part of that cap on compensation because it's considered cash compensation. However, the retirement plan for that S-Corp shareholder should be able to come separate. Now, that said, those being good news for those two categories, nothing has changed for the self-employed or the partners. Their rules are still the same as they were. You cannot use the retirement plan money. You cannot use the health care because the theory is that's including their self-employment. Now, for partners, you kind of use the health care because you almost certainly are treating it as a guaranteed payment. Uh, you know, that that's how you're supposed to treat it if the partnership's paying for it. So you're kind of counting it. It's a little more obvious for self-employed, for let's say a sole proprietor, that may not be so obvious, but you're not taking on a Schedule C, but you had to have Schedule C income to get it on your adjustment. So that, that that's kind of how they ruled that one works. So that was nice. The other thing that's not so nice there, though, they did clarify, and I wasn't surprising. You cannot, while you can pay for, you know, retirement plan expenses, and I believe you can pay for ones like you could pay for the 2019 funding because that was incurred before and the paid or incurred rule should cover it. There's at least one plan consultant that was quoted in tax notes today, federal, that said that does, she didn't think that was totally clear that you could do that, but she thought you could. I, I think it's clear enough and you should be able to do that. But what you cannot do is pay for any retirement plan amounts, or that won't count toward forgiveness, any retirement plan, plan amounts that deal with services performed after the last day of the covered period. That can make it very difficult to work on 2020 numbers, depending upon the nature of your plan, when somebody accrues a benefit, and how you determine how to allocate that, how much gets allocated to each account. And yeah, it there are all kinds of questions there about the 2020 compensation. I might even argue it's easier for a defined benefit plan in this structure. You know, I don't really have separate accounts, but I might be able to get a better number of the actuary for the for the amount that covers that period. I guess some sort of defensible thing. It's a lot more interesting for something like a profit sharing plan or the variant. We all know a profit sharing plan, which is a 401k plan, where you make discretionary contributions for the employer. It's a profit sharing plan, guys. That's all a 401k plan is these days, is a profit sharing plan that allows employees to put money in. We just always refer to it as a 401k plan because that's how everybody refers to it. But it's got that same issue. So that's a complication. Probably not good if you're thinking about trying to prepay your entire 2020 plan contribution and use that for forgiveness. The flip side of it, though, to be honest, is with the 24-week covered period, most companies, if they're still in business, uh, probably are going to have no trouble when they can use 24 weeks of expenses. Obviously, if they're out of business, then we may have more issues. But then we're probably not prepaying 2020, uh, you know, profit sharing plan contributions if we're going under. So I'm going to guess that's going to be less of an issue. They also did clarify one other nice thing on the non-payroll loans, which is that it wasn't totally clear to some people. It says, you know, if you're paying, lease payments could count, but it had to be a lease that, that you had in place before, uh, you know, be, be before February 15th, 2020. Well, what if I had a lease that expired on March 15th, let's say March 31st of 2020, and I sign a renewal? As long as you're renewing a lease you had before, the payments on the renewed lease will still count. So, you know, that, that, that that's kind of nice. Uh, it's kind of useful to see. There is some more additional information on the reductions, you know, the various reduction calculations. And we've got that. Uh, basically, most of that just clarifies things you already know. But if you're going to be applying for forgiveness, you really should take a look and read this FAQ from the SBA. 
more stuff coming up from COVID-19. The IRS put a public put an item on their website, which was leave sharing plans, frequently asked questions, the IRS website on August the 4th, 2020. Now, notice 2006-59, many years ago, uh, provided a system whereby employers could set up this thing called a leave sharing program. Okay. The idea of this is that I can attribute some of my leave, irrevocably send part of my paid leave to this pool that could be used by other employees under certain conditions. Okay. Or maybe it'd be used by me, but it go to this general purpose pool. Now, the idea being that now with coronavirus, you know, you may find out that those people who are unlucky enough to come down with corona, with COVID-19, and who react badly. And we know there's a lot of people who may get it and will never show symptoms. And there are some that will get it and will be down for way more than two weeks. We've discovered, you know, we find out new, we find out more stuff about this longer we go. But we definitely know there are cases of people who will be really knocked down hard by this and will be out for an extended period of time. So the idea being that the employees could contribute portions of everybody's leave. And then if an employee got clipped by COVID-19 badly, they could, when they ran out of their leave, they could use pool leave and be able to cover themselves. The idea being that, you know, if we have 200 employees, vast majority of them are not going to have this problem. But with 200, there's a decent chance at least one at some point will. And this would give us the option. Well, the IRS points out that, yes, you can use this plan to cover it. You know, now the plan, the requirements for the plan are found, uh, and there's eight separate requirements listed in notice 2,659. Generally, you put it in the bank, right? You know, you can't specify this leave is for a specific person. So I can't say I'm putting this in the bank to be used by my spouse, you know, I, I'm not allowed to do that or put used by my kid or used by my buddy. I can't do any of that. I've got to put in a pool that's just generally available, right? Uh, you know, you can't exceed the maximum leave you normally accrue during a year. So if you have somebody who's, you know, you have an employer that lets you bank leave for multiple years and you've got, you know, three months of leave, but you only earn two weeks of it every year, you can't let somebody put more than two weeks in. You can't let somebody put in their two months into this pool. You know, well, you can't and get the tax benefits we want in this case, okay? Uh, you know, you, you, you can get it back. You know, you can come back if you, like, become sick with COVID-19. You essentially can get from the pool, but you're not allowed to take your leave back from the pool. Just say, okay, I want it back now. Please give it back to me. You're not really allowed to do that. You know, and you've got to kind of work around those issues. But what this tells you is, and we told you, you know, check the notice for the programs. The IRS simply confirmed that you could set up a program like I described tied to COVID-19 issues. So the qualified employees be those with a COVID-19 diagnosis, you know, or suspected COVID-19 diagnosis. They could use leave from the pool and it would be perfectly OK. Now, why you like this plan, if you do it this way, there is no tax consequence of the employee upon the donation. The concern was if I have leave time and if I convert it and I move it into the pool, is that effectively constructive receipt by me of the leave when I push it back in? And if I do it and send it back in to be used by, you know, my buddy, that's probably constructive receipt and probably subject to payroll tax. It probably needs to be in my W-2. Okay, because I was the one that had that. It was my services. So doing it this way solves that problem. Now, the flip side of that is because employees tend to think this way. Clients do all the time, too. No, they don't get to claim a charitable contribution deduction for putting their leave into this pool. It doesn't work that way. Probably surprises nobody on this broadcast that it doesn't work that way, but it will surprise clients. So tell them, no, their employees do not get a deduction. They just don't have to pay tax on the income which is, you know, that's your tax break. So don't worry about it. Next up is notice 2020-59 issued on July 28, 2020. This was issued with the final regulations under the uh, 163J business interest rules. And what it was meant to do is provides a safe harbor for a qualified residential living facility under 163J. Uh, the concern was some people couldn't tell if these things, you know, it's one of those things where 
uh, you go, you know, you're, you're, you want the possibility of having some care. So you go there, you're renting, you know, an apartment. But along with that rental, you have the right to consume certain to a certain level of medical services. Some of these have, you know, all the way from very, very hands off, almost no service would be provided. You, know, you don't need almost anything, but it would allow you to stay there all through the time where you may need to have like 24 seven skilled nursing. So it's a facility like that. The question being, they're capital intensive. They borrow a lot. 163J would hurt them. The question becomes, could these be considered a real estate trader business? And the IRS said, well, we, we understand that that's an issue. So we're going to give you this proposed revenue procedure. And what this revenue procedure that you can use until it's finalized allows you to do is if you meet the requirement, you can be treated as a real estate trader business for 163J purposes. Now, in order to do this, you've got to meet the requirement to be a qualified residential living facility. And the revenue procedure defines that as one that consists of multiple rental dwelling units within one or more buildings or structures that serve its primary residence on a permanent or semi-permanent basis to individual customers or patients. It includes provision of supplemental assistive nursing or other routine medical services and has an average period of customer or patient use of the rental units. It's 90 days or more. Now, there's special definition in there for how you determine your average use, what supplemental assistive nursing or other medical services, and what it means by semi or permanent or semi or semi permanent basis for a living facility. But if you meet that requirement, so you meet those three, and most of these types of facilities should, you're, you consider yourself for this purpose only, not for any other purpose, to be a real estate trader business. Now, why they say for no other purpose is they don't want somebody turning around now and trying to argue. They're not going to concede you're going to be a real estate pro if you own one of these. You know, you own one, you're down there full time, and you've got this rental losing money. You know, they're not going to concede that you're a real estate pro. So all they're saying is for this purpose, 163J only a real estate business. And because of that, you can become an electing real estate trader business. What that allows you to do is get out of the 163J limits, but you end up using ADR depreciation lives on your real property. Now, generally, if you have lots of interest, you're very highly leveraged you're way better off being able to deduct the interest than you are can continuing to be able to use non-ADR, especially under current rules if you just got the building because the ADR life versus the regular life, there's not a whole lot of difference at this point. We're looking at 40 years for ADR, 39 years for regular. Not exactly a huge difference. It's a little different if you got the building before 2017 or before September 2017 because then the ADR life was 50 years for that building, not 39. But the good news is you don't have to go back and recalculate depreciation. And your change of method is considered to be a change of, of use. And all you got to do is figure out your remaining basis, you know, un your remaining adjusted basis in the building. How much time would be left under the 50-year amortization and just amortize or depreciate the adjusted basis over that remaining period. And the IRS issued a revenue procedure on this uh, back in 2018, as I recall, pretty much covers that. Other thing we got covered from the CARES Act, some more issues here. Well, CARES and other issues. Uh, and the SECURE Act, notice 2020-62, issued on August the 6th. The IRS has updated the safe harbor notices that are provided to plan participants when they receive a distribution from the plan that is eligible for rollover treatment. Okay. You're required to, under the law, we talk about this, th this is a requirement under Section 402F of the law that a qualified plan must provide to participants when they get a distribution that is eligible to be treated as a rollover distribution, information on how to do the rollover. And the IRS has issued, and they've issued continuously, you know, as law changes, they issue these safe harbor notices. If you use the safe harbor notice, or at least use the parts that are appropriate for your plan, that's considered to be a proper notice. You don't have to use them, but if you don't, then you know the onus is on you to show that you had one that was easily understood and was correct. So generally, people will use the safe harbor notices because why reinvent first? Why spend the time to reinvent the wheel, the time and the expense to do it? 
And number two, why take the risk? If an agent, you know, if you're in, you're examined by DOL or the IRS and they ask for the notices you gave and you give these notices, you're not going to be asking more questions. So people tend to use these notices. Now, the CARES Act and the SECURE Act made some changes to plans. And whenever that happens, the IRS has to update these notices. So these new notices have been updated. Now, they specifically indicated three areas that were involved in these changes. First, they talked about areas in there about a, that's a qualified birth or adoption distribution. This was added by the CARES Act. Uh, taxpayers who take these are eligible to put the money back in officially at any time, though obviously if they get beyond three years, they've got a problem because they have to pick it up in income immediately if they don't put it back in before filing the return for the electric distribution. So they need to get it back in in time to get a ref to comply for a refund. So for practical purposes, it's three years. And we'll see when they did this again, Congress realized they probably should have just said three years there, but didn't. So that's a problem they didn't. They're going to have to give information about the change for required beginning dates, right? So what's considered to be a minimum distribution, what is not. So some language to fix that so they understand about that. Because you can't roll over a required minimum distribution, and that's the first thing you're considered to take every year. But once you clear that number, it's eligible for rollover. So you have to explain that. That's in the notice. It also talks about CARES Act coronavirus related distributions. We discussed the ruling on that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, if you have one of those, some information about those rollovers, how they work. Now, there are two separate notices, example notices in the back of this notice. And those two, one is for Roth IRA, uh, you know, or not Roth IRA, but what are considered to be Roth 401k plan distributions or distributions that contain Roth 401k matters and non-Roth 401k ones. But those are both back in there. If you are sponsoring a qualified plan, you're responsible for these notices or you administer such plans. And you, you, know, you need to be aware that you should update your notices or, and certainly take a close look at these here. Now, as the IRS warns you with this, and I didn't keep up on the slides there for the other two type of distributions, as the IRS warns you in this case, um, if the law changes again, and we know Congress will change the law again, they may even do it in the bill they're considering now. I haven't heard anything about them doing it, but hey, they love to change things. So when they do that, yes, you'll have to change these. They will no longer be safe then. And so at least in the interim, until new notices come out, you'll have to put something in there describing any changes. But otherwise, these should work in the interim. So you might want to take a look at that. Now, just before I got ready to record this, I received notice. Uh, that the president had signed an executive order. He had been saying late in the week that he was going to do this if negotiations did not come up with an agreement by Friday, which they didn't, regarding the, I guess, CARES 4, whatever we're going to call this one, uh, you know, the new bill. It'll be called something other than CARES 4, but it's what people refer to it now as CARES 4. Uh, he would basically be issuing these. And there's a series of these. There are, as I recall, four separate executive orders. But the one of interest to us is the payroll tax one. And so this is the memorandum on deferring payroll tax obligations in light of the ongoing COVID-19 disaster. Executive orders signed by the president on August the 8th, 2020. And this executive order directs Treasury to defer the withholding and payment of the employee portion of the old age survivor and disability insurance portion of FICA. Now, remember, with the CARES Act and the, you know, Paycheck Protection Program Flexibility Act rules, laws that we got, essentially, every employer today already on the employer portion of this tax has been allowed to not pay it currently. And they'll be able to pay it in two installments, one at December 31st of 2020, one at December 31st, 2021. So what they've done now is, or what the president has done is said, well, we're going to direct Treasury to say that from September 1st to the end of December, uh, employers will be directed, the Treasury will put out rules that, that will defer the withholding, the payment and collection of these taxes. So the tax will not have to be withheld. It will not be have to be paid over to the IRS. The IRS will not attempt to collect it from September 1st to December 31st. 
Now, this is under the authority of 7508 Cap A, which we discussed back when we talked about the extended due dates and all of that stuff back in March and April. Well, now here's the catch. 7508 Cap A clearly gives the Treasury, and obviously the President is in charge. The President can order Treasury to do things. That's kind of how the line of authority works. So they clearly can defer the payment, but 7508A talks about deferring payments, does not talk about eliminating them. And this order does not eliminate them. So the key catch is that right now, Treasury is to make sure we're told to stop withholding, apparently, and to you know not pay over between September 1st and December 31st. Now, there is a cap on this, you cannot, you you know, the people who get this have to be getting a gross payroll check that is $4,000 or less on a biweekly basis. And then you adjust that if your pay period is not biweekly, you will adjust that to the appropriate number. So, for instance, a weekly payroll would be 2000 right? You know, you'll, you'll get these weird numbers, right, that you'll do. But basically, you'll make that adjustment, get it going. You know, a semi-monthly will be slightly more than four thousand. Uh, you know, monthly would be just slightly over eighty-five hundred, eighty-six hundred. So basically, those would be the keys. And it appears to be a cliff. If you go one penny above the limit, you have to withhold and pay over the FICA. If you're one penny below, you don't withhold and pay over the FICA. Now, Treasury's directed to consider how forgive how forgiveness might be given, including pursuing legislation. Well, a lot of people think that Treasury probably is going to have to get that legislation. There may be other ways. I mean, I guess they could try to stretch a blanket, uh, you know, OIC, uh, offering compromise for everybody. But that really seems to be stretching things. And I'm not sure they like that because of the, you know, the problem is, you know, what that does in terms of a precedent it sets for what presidents can do to effectively legislate without Congress. So I'm sure they'd prefer not to go there, Uh, but we've got it. But the hitch right now is per this order, all we would know for sure on September 1st is Treasury will issue guidance on this. And, you know, you in theory would stop withholding the tax on the employee. You wouldn't pay it over, but eventually the employee is going to owe that tax back. Because we're deferring it. Now, how that would work mechanically, major problem. Nobody knows. And there's another problem. Section 3102A, hopefully I got that referenced right, requires employers to withhold the FICA tax for employees at the time the wage is paid. It says nothing about paying it over. And the now I suppose in our 7508A, you could you know, say that, yeah, that, that, that's an expanded time-sensitive uh, time sensitive act. We're deferring it. 7508 Cap A, which references 7508 Little A, that kind of broad authority sits there. But the problem is, okay, we get to December 31st. Now the money's owed. Does the employer have to withhold it now? Next question is, from where? And even better question, okay, maybe from the employee's future paycheck, the next paycheck. Okay, great. But what if the employee had quit? The employee died. You know, I don't, in essence, there are huge numbers of practical problems with actually getting this paid. So if you haven't figured it out, this is, for all practical purposes, a game of chicken. But with the president is starting with Congress, right? He's essentially knowing he's going to do this. It's going to be a nightmare if Congress does not put in a bill of forgiveness. So he's kind of forcing their hand is the idea here. So he will get his payroll tax holiday that he's been insisting upon that doesn't seem to have a lot of, it's actually, it hasn't even been thrilling for anybody on either side of the aisle has never been thrilled about the payroll tax holiday, but apparently he's going to get it. You know, his theory is he'll get it this way because Congress is going to have to forgive or there's going to be this nightmare. And he clearly can defer the payment. So now he's just doing this knowing that people are going to see this big bill at the end of December and yeah, freak out on paying it. So 
Yeah, we'll have to see. Certainly want to keep an eye on that legislation and watch out for that 3102A issue. How does the Treasury deal with that? How do we deal with this? And if we don't have forgiveness legislation by the time Treasury brings out their notice, I presume Treasury better tell us how it'll get paid. You know, how do people pay it? At what time? You know, do we have now the individual has to pay it personally? And if that's the way it is, you know, can't, are employees going to be able to say, well, I don't want to do that. Go ahead and keep taking it and sending it in. Because if you allow that, that's certainly what employees will do. So this is going to be a mess to watch over the next few weeks. Also, remind your employees on <laughs> immediately, because they're going to read about this, this does not take effect until September 1st. Their next paycheck is going to still have FICA taken out of it. It's not going to be missing next paycheck. It's not till September 1st. Get a copy of the executive order and show it to them because I guarantee you some of your employees will not believe you. Get it and saying here, circled, September 1st. And maybe we'll get the PDF with Donald's signature with the Sharpie so we can even, even more easily show them. See here, he signed it. It says September 1st. You know, you got a problem, talk with him, right, about why it's September 1st. But that's what he said, September 1st. We all know it's September 1st because we've got to have some time to get these procedures in place. So keep your eye on this for the next few weeks. We'll see how this goes forward, what happens here. But this will be very, very interesting. As I say, what we've got here is a game of chicken. You know, uh, the president is clearly trying to force Congress's hand on this issue. And we'll see how Congress reacts. Could be an interesting, interesting time, shall we say, over the next few weeks. Well, I want to remind you, I do have a couple of CPE broadcasts coming up. I will be doing for New Jersey Society. I'll be doing a monthly four-hour update on August the 12th. You can sign up on their website. Uh, on the 13th, I'll do a, I'll begin a series of three eight-hour courses on Thursday, Friday, the following Monday. On Thursday, I'll be doing income taxation of trusts and estates, and we will look at the Arizona Uniform Principal and Income Act. So that'll be that day for eight hours. On Friday, the 14th, we'll talk about pl- planning for the Qualified Business Income Deduction, 199 Cap A, which, remember that tax? That seemed like a, that was a really big deal not long ago, right? Well, we'll talk some more about it, how it's working. Go over that and review that if you need that. And we'll talk about partnership taxation advantages for eight hours. Now, I should say all three of these will be offered later. Don't have the date right off, but they will be offered later as rebroadcast by Cal CPA under their system. So if your state society gets the Cal CPA sessions, you can look for these course titles and eventually I'll be involved in some of those rebroadcasts. That'll come up and that'll be those sessions coming up too. So some of you outside Arizona will also have access to this. So just warning to keep your eyes open for that. Well, this has been the current federal tax developments for the week of August the 10th. You can catch our regular updates on our website at currentfulltaxdevelopments.com. If you have any questions or comments, you can send them to me, Ed Zollers at currentfulltaxdevelopments.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Ed Zollers. I do participate in the Connect websites for the Arizona, Minnesota, uh, Illinois, New Jersey, and Washington Society of CPAs. I check in there. New Jersey Society's website's down currently because... They, they might have heard about a little storm that hit the East Coast. Yeah, that, that was a problem. They, they have a nice snapped power pull on the way in. So their website's still not back up. But the Connect site is, the, the Connect website, not the website actually, it was as long as your, your cookie expired, then, then you couldn't get back in. But you actually canceled it by email, so I'm still doing some stuff there. I also check in from time to time to Cal CPA's Tax Talk and the Reddit group slash r slash tax pros, so you can check in there. Uh, if you have any questions, if your state society has a resource that allows you to do this kind of you know, interaction among members in a discussion group, I suggest you get involved in it. It can be very, very useful. Now, it's one of those things. It's as useful as the members make it. So, But we've got some very active groups, especially in Arizona and the New Jersey group, uh, are very active in this area. So we see a lot of activity going on there. So yeah, check and make sure how those things work. And if you've got an option to join, get in and start talking. It'll really, you'll find it's a very, very useful resource, especially for things like state tax issues, because that's always the toughest thing to get. You know, it's tough to find somebody who really specializes, you know, who spends a lot of time on New Jersey income tax issues. You know, or it's not really that New Jersey, forget what we call the tax. But, you know, but New Jersey's tax issues, 
because if you're not in New Jersey, you don't pay much attention to it. So most of the country doesn't. But if you're practicing, that's a big deal. That's true in all of our states, right? Most people don't care about Arizona income taxes, but when you're here in Arizona, you do about how they work. So it's a really good place to find it. So consider that resource from your state society if your state society has such a program. And otherwise, uh, we'll be back here next week on the 17th. Maybe we will or won't have guidance from Treasury implementing the president's executive order. Uh, we'll also see what other sorts of things have come up during the week, what else happens. We may or may not have new legislation. You know, those negotiations will continue. We'll see what happens there. Plus, the IRS has been really good about throwing out regs recently. We will have a set of regs on the deduction for state and local taxes and the state tax credits. I'll talk about that next week. It came out late on Friday. I thought the FICA thing I better talk about right away. So that's why I brought that up today. And anything else happens during the week. So join us here next week for more current federal tax developments.